Hello and welcome to another episode of CISO Tradecraft, the podcast that provides you with the information, knowledge, and wisdom to be a more effective cybersecurity leader. My name is G. Mark Hardy, and today we're going to explore how to use gamification to motivate and direct your team toward achieving what even they might not have considered possible. As always, please follow us on LinkedIn and make sure you subscribe so you can always get the latest updates. Shall we play a game? Does that remind you of anything? Anybody remember the old Matthew Broderick movie, War Games from 1983, where he basically hacks into a computer and tries to pretend to be Professor Falcon? And then the computer gets going and says, shall we play a game? And of course, it turns into global thermonuclear war fighting against the Whopper. And well, of course, I probably have seen the movie, but if not, I I don't think I'm going to spoil the ending by telling you that they don't destroy the world. But he did have an Altair 8800 in the background in his bedroom. And I I had one of those too. I built one back in 1975. So in any case, the idea is that games work. Well, Let's find out why we can actually use them in our business environment and how you as a CISO or a security leader can actually put this to use. Well, let's start out with a definition. Now, Nico King states that gamification is, quote, the process of applying game-related elements and mechanics to non-game contexts and environments. Okay, well, what do you mean non-game contexts? Um, I don't know. I guess, if you think about it, a game sort of exists for the sake of a game. However, gamification says, in this context, we want to actually do something. We want some real-world scenario to be played out, but allow someone to come up with different outcomes so that they might be able to learn or do something differently after playing the game. I mean, think about it as you were a kid. Your parents probably had chores and mundane stuff you just didn't want to do, but... If you had a number of kids in your family, I, I was one of six. Today, I don't think you see that a whole lot. But maybe your parents convinced you to have a race to see who could clean the room the fastest or who could go ahead and get something done the quickest. And as a result, because it came into a game, it was a bit of a trick as parents. And as parents, we kind of do that maybe on our own kids. But who doesn't really want to get a reward for finishing first? So In a way, it's modifying behavior, but it's modifying behavior in such a way that it's affecting your real world. So let's look at some reasons to potentially use gamification. Number one, motivation. You can motivate people because, well, people sometimes suffer from low morale. They need some inspiration. This is going to give a vision. And if you can just say, hey, I know where you're at. This is not really exciting, but we can get to here and it's a much better place and we can be motivated to try to accomplish something if you build it right. Number two, engagement. You can captivate participants. You offer them enjoyment and excitement. Now, let's face it. All jobs have stuff that we don't want to do. (laughs) That's why we get paid. If we're all fun, we wouldn't have to get a paycheck. We just do it anyway. So they're the stuff that has to get done, but still needs to get done. And in the military, we had a phrase for that. It's called (laughs) embrace the suck. It means you've got to find a way to just not only tolerate difficult times, but find some way to say, I'm going to push through it. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to get there. Whether it's just going through BUDS, Basic Underwater Demolition School, Hell Week, or being stuck in a prison or war camp for years, like some of the veterans were from the Vietnam War, or some other just unpleasant experience. You found a way to just engage, get it done, and make it happen. You press through. So we had motivate and engage. Number three is to challenge. Let's get people to think outside the box. Is there a contest we could find a way who could sell the most product or do things differently? I know that many years ago, I was the uh, combined federal campaign chairman for our ship. Now, anybody who's ever been in the government knows that the combined federal campaign is an annual fundraiser where you try to get people to go ahead and put in some little deduction or withholding out of their paycheck to go to a number of charities. And back then, there weren't that many of them today. I think there's an entire catalog. Well, I got permission from the commanding officer to, well, kind of gamify it. And we came up with some rules that allowed if every member of a division contributed to the combined federal campaign, even a dollar a month, because it was a 12-month campaign, that division got their double payout for their 
funds that were basically from what's called the Welfare and Recreation Fund. Now we're on a seven month deployment, so there's no place to spend it when you're out at sea. So the money kept building up, building up. So basically, there were, we create a little bit of a peer pressure there. The game, hey guys, come on, if we all chip in, we can do it. Secondly, had an opportunity to do a bit of a drawing where we're trying to go ahead and get people to say, hey, you want to go ahead and win a 24-hour leave or 48-hour or get some other like, dinner with the captain or something like that, or maybe dinner with dinner without the XO. It depends on you know, what motivates you. But the point was, is that it turned into a game. It was kind of neat because although we weren't on the largest ship in the fleet, we had the number one contribution list. We collected, I think, everybody on the ship with one exception. It was the ship's doctor. He was LDS. He said, I already tithe. I'm not going to do anything else. And no amount of peer pressure would budge him, but literally every other sailor chipped in. And we broke the record and set the record. It might still be there for the Pacific fleet at a 99.6 or 7% participation rate. Pretty cool because it became a game. So as you're trying to go ahead and think about things, it doesn't have to be fundraising. It could be something else, which is, of course, what we're going to be talking about. But if you've been listening to me for a while, you know, I like to tell sea stories and hopefully they're relevant. So motivate, engage, challenge. Number four, relate. You want to create a positive and a relevant experience for the participant. They get in there, they do something, they say, hey, I get this. I feel like I'm in charge. I'm empowered to do something and I can relate to whatever character role they've been placed in in the game or whatever thing has been set up. And then lastly, the fifth one is a reward. We want to incentivize good behavior, provide some sort of satisfaction, but also we're thinking about trying to say, can we maybe change people's behavior? If we can give a reward, people tend to behave, change their behavior to achieve it. Anybody who's ever had dogs, rewards work. It's a way to train your dog. And after a while, the dog starts doing the behavior, not because you're getting a treat every single time, but because it's ingrained in your brain that, hey, this is a pleasurable experience. I associate doing whatever I'm supposed to do, sit, heal, whatever, with what once was really nice, like getting a little piece of bacon. But more to the point, we change that behavior for the long term. So when we want to do gamification, what we're talking about is being able to do five different reasons. We want to motivate our people, get them engaged, challenge them to be able to try to do something they haven't been able to do before, give them a chance to relate to these experiences and generate some sort of meaningful reward. Now, why do people want to play games? Pretty much three reasons. The psychological needs, and this comes out of a Chaos Theory Games website that I was doing some research on, competency. You get a feeling of achievement is a sensation that most humans chase. We want to be good at something, and we want to get recognized for it. So games are a way to manifest our progress, our goals. So that we can go ahead and improve a skill in a way that's engaging and fun. Anybody who's ever played a, a video game just for the heck of playing video games, let's forget about learning experiences right now. What do you do? You go back, and I'll probably fall back on Super Mario as one of the references that probably most of us remember. You go ahead and you start the game, doodly, 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 and out goes Mario. And eventually something goes wrong. Usually the first time you play, you don't last too long. Something bites you, eats you, whatever, and bloop, 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 Mario dies. Well, do you just say, up, oh, game over, that's it, life's ended. I'm going to go out and play football or something. No, you go back and you want to go at it again. You want to get good at it to the point where you can show off to everybody else. Hey guys, watch this. I can get that. And off you go. So competency, number one. Number two, autonomy. A lot of humans, most humans really want to be independent. They want to be in control of their actions. Now in the real world, sometimes we don't have a whole lot of control, but in the game, a player can take control of their character's actions and sometimes even manipulate the in-game environment to suit their preferences. So now they're large and in charge in this new environment, and that's a reason to play a game. So one, we can feel confident. Two, we have this autonomy. And then the third one, which I kind of mentioned a little bit before when I was talking about related, is the relatedness to the in-game stories. Something that says, hey, I can figure this out. I get that, whether I'm going an explorer, whether I'm going to go ahead on an adventure, or in a particular case where we're trying to go ahead and get somebody immersed in a game. We want them to connect with the content. Now, 
One of the difficulties when it comes to things such as training and education and changing people's behavior is any of us who's ever sat through a boring lecture or had to give one, hopefully not a boring one, is the significantly reduced human attention span that adults and children, but even adults now seem to have. It's now down and below about nine seconds. If you're still listening, congratulations, you made it past the first nine seconds. In fact, you made it past the first nine minutes, and so you're doing well. But we're going to do a game. Don't just do a game for gaming's sake, okay? Because if you go back, Nico King goes on to state that you want to build what he calls a serious game. Now, what's the difference? A game is designed to exist or entertain or distract. And so what happens is the design of that is to say, hey, I want to go ahead and have fun. Or I just want to stop thinking about where I'm at right now and I want to immerse myself in some alternate reality for a while. Okay, that's a game. And that's great. But when you're done with the game, well, not much has changed in the real world. Not too many times have I ever had to go ahead and fight Bowser going down the street or deal with the Goomba coming at me trying to say, can I jump on this or jump up in the air and collect a whole bunch of gold coins. But that's a fun entertainment. That's a distraction. But a serious game is designed to make a lasting impact on the players. Essentially, what happens is we create a purpose. And that purpose, which is built into the game, is going to transcend the entertainment. So for us as leaders, our challenge is to build a game that's going to be both as entertaining as well as have a meaningful goal. And the pursuit of that goal should impart some long-lasting knowledge or behavior, putting our people in a better state than they were before. Now, these serious games can do a number of things. They can trigger an emotional response. That is to say, you get into it, and if you've ever gotten frustrated about something or yeah, fist pump in the air, man, I got it. There's an emotional response, whether you either don't succeed or do succeed in the game. People learn more when their emotions are activated. People make different choices when their emotions are activated. It's basic human nature. If we were all driven by left brain psychology, if we were Vulcans, we would say, smoking and drinking is illogical. We should be working out five times a day and doing all of this and eating our kale and vegetables and things like that. Great. But reality is we kind of do what feels good because it's an emotional side. So we trigger emotional responses with a serious game, trying to reward those behaviors that we want. We Number two, we want to motivate behavioral changes. As our game participants go through and they realize that by doing certain actions instead of other actions, they get the type of response they're looking for from the system, they're going to start to change your behavior because they know that these are things that work out well. They're rewarded. And then lastly, if we have a serious game, it'd be great if we can make it create a memorable experience. Something that people said, man, that was awesome. I want to share this with other people. I want to talk about it. Okay, so we set the foundation for let's go out and create this meaningful game. We want to create a serious game. We want to do it in a way that causes users to be motivated, engaged, challenged, relate to what we're doing and create a reward. And we are meeting these basic psychological needs of competency, autonomy, and relatedness. What comes next? Well, we want to look at the gamification concepts that we could apply in your organization to create positive change. Here's number one, create a leaderboard. A leaderboard is a game element that shows where the players are ranked in the system. It's designed to encourage healthy competition. It celebrates the top players. How about a creating a leaderboard where each business unit reporting the CEO is ranked in terms of how well their employees perform during fishing exercises? Which Group clicked the malicious phishing test the least. Which organization reported the attacks the most? Leaderboards invite competition because a lot of people just want to win. At a riddle minimum, they don't want to be dead last. One of the best uses of a leaderboard that I recall was John Stryfer when he was Department of State. So this goes back over a decade. But as CIO, what had happened was is that State being a very distributed organization. And by the way, as a Navy officer, I didn't realize this as somebody said, do you realize the entire total of all the State Department employees is less than the crew of one U.S. aircraft carrier? Like about 6,000 people. I don't think it's changed much lately from the last time I checked. Anyway, but those people are scattered in countries all over the world. 
And as a result of trying to go ahead and manage all these computers and networks in a far-flung area, how do you motivate people to prioritize patching and things like that? So what he did is he said, hey, we're going to go ahead and assign a point total to all the patches that need to get applied. And we're going to let everybody know how well you're doing. Okay, so far, so good. And he made it really easy at the beginning. So pretty much everybody got an A. Hey, great. You know, you patch this, you patch that. You're doing great. And if you left stuff unpatched, you didn't really get whacked. <laughs> it's a trap. Then he said, hey, we're going to go ahead and create a leaderboard so everybody can see how you do relative to everybody else. And at that point, they go, hey, I don't care. I got an A. I'm going to look good. And sure enough, everybody looked great on these leaderboards. Everybody's saying, man, we are great as an organization. Well, that was just the setup. And what came next was the real instantiation. And so therefore, I remember when the Aurora, I guess it was MSO6, and I don't remember the actual number there of the, of the problem. This is before you did CBEs on it. But in any case, that patch was a critical one. And so what happened was he assigned that to be 10 points. And if he didn't patch it, tomorrow was 20. And the next day it was 40. And then you got more. all of a sudden your A, if you didn't do anything for a couple of days, was now suddenly a B and a B minus. And it's like, what's happened? I was on the top of this leaderboard. So what do people do? <laughs> they want to get back up on top. And so as a result, within 30 days, state had well over 90% of those patches installed throughout their entire enterprise. After six months, the Department of Defense wasn't even at 50%. It works. Leaderboards work. It motivates people. Nobody wants to be embarrassed. They want to show off in front of everybody else. You're using peer pressure to motivate, and you can build that into your games, which then become, hey, I want to win this game. Reality is what's happening. You're patching these systems. You're making things a whole lot better. You can create a leaderboard for vulnerability management. Which organizations have the lowest time to patch their vulnerabilities? which hit their SLAs the most. If you highlight the attributes that you care about and you can create some sort of a leaderboard so people can get be on display and know how they're doing, that helps. But that's not really a game per se, but it's part of what works. Another thing that's going to work well in terms of gamification concepts is badges and achievements, sort of in-game rewards that provide you with a sense of satisfaction, completion. They have to be a little bit of exclusiveness to make them desirable. Because the finish line could be a long, long way away, and you don't necessarily want to just say, hey, you don't get any recognition until you pass it. I've run marathons before. Got to tell you, that's a long haul. You get to 20 miles, and as they say, you're only halfway there. But you get to 26 miles, 385 yards, you're done. But there's people cheering you along the way, and every single mile there's a little marker. Hey, you just passed mile two, mile three, mile four, mile five, and things such as that. A little psychological trick that I did for myself that really helped when I was marathon training, because I didn't have anybody to do it with, is that when I was doing the runs, and you, it takes a long time to prepare for one of these things, but if I were doing a five-mile run, in my mind, I'd start at mile 21. And when I hit mile one, I'm at 22, 23, 24, 25. So I kept hitting 24, 5, 6. And when I go for an eight-mile run, you start at 18. And when you go for a 10-mile run, you start at 16. And then what happened is after doing this over and over again, when you're running the real marathon, by the time you hit the wall by your body's like ready to say, I'm done, you go like, wait a minute, I've been here 100 times before. And you just kept right on going and you finish. All right. So one of the things of being able to provide badges and achievements as you go along. Now, maybe you give out little stickers that people can put on their laptop, something that goes and gives them some sort of a recognition. They are the first folks to report fishing attack during the quarterly fishing exercise. And therefore, you can accrue these things on there. In the military, we had badges and achievements. That was a currency that we used. And so as a result, you can't give your people stock options. You can't give them bonuses. You can't go ahead and give them extra time off necessarily. But what you can do is give them hard work and a reward. And the reward is tangible when it's something you can actually wear. And in the military, you wear your career on your set of medals and ribbons. And once you learn how to read that code, you can look at a person and very quickly say, man, she is a mover and a shaker. She's done this, 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 this. Or this person, you're like, eh, not so much. But the point is, is you have some exclusivity to reaching a certain level or badges or achievement or whatever, you're going to create a demand. If it were just free, if anybody could just have it, hey, come by and pick up whatever sticker you want. They're just in a pile, meh. Then it's just kind of like going to DEF CON. Everybody's got stickers and you stick them on and then all of a sudden. But if you had something that really meant something, that was really cool, you create a sense of pride because, hey, I did this. And what you're doing 
is you relate that, for example, to fishing reporting. And not only did you cash the fish of the month on the fishing test, but you got a real one. And not like a real one that was pretty obvious, like, well, you know, our Nigerian prince who's got $10 million in little blue pills that he wants to send to us in Bitcoin, but something that was rather clever and they, they got it. Now you've got, you've turned your whole workforce into a cyber army and they're reporting phishing attacks faster than they've seen before because you've changed that behavior. This is fun. It's rewarded. So number one, create a leaderboard. Number two, badges and achievements. Number three, levels and progression. If we think about any game, for example, Mario, multiple levels, you play over and over and over again. And as you go up higher, you get farther, you get better skills that go along the way. Think about, for example, in martial arts, if you go to white belt or yellow belt, green, red, or black, and then ultimately double black belt. I knew a gentleman, it was like a fifth level black belt. And it's like, what do you learn at fifth level black belt? I mean, you go ahead and you cut cars in half with it. He says, no, it's psychological. At that point, it's all in your mind. You've already learned all the physical stuff. But as we're looking at creating skills along the way, these levels and progression, that's say we have something for secure software development. What are the basics you want people to learn? What architecture and security standards should they understand? Maybe Yellow Belt has to take three specific training classes in your cybersecurity dojo. And then after a while, the developer gets that belt. Can they show it to their peers? Can we see this for certificates? Can you have a journey with progressive levels that get bragging rights and things such as that as you work your way up? So for example, you could say we had a program at 1,000 people take secure software development classes. Of those who started it, 35% made it to black belt. That means they can demonstrate skills in this, this, and this. And again, that peer pressure is going to help when somebody else sees them getting farther ahead and somebody else isn't. Come on, guy, get with the program. Let's go. So we've got a leaderboard, badges and achievements, levels and progressions. Number four, unlockables. Think about it. If you're playing video games, you love this exciting content. Okay, you get to find something that there's an avatar or a custom level or something, some swag that you can only get, but you've got to go ahead and say you've got to get to this point. Maybe we make it hard to get so that it only happens if 100% of applications that complete the yearly security re review of their apps, then we're going to give everybody security team. It doesn't have to be something virtual. It could be really like a hoodie or maybe a, uh, what we used to call in the Navy basket leave. You have day off of work and you'd be surprised what your compliant rights do. Again, if there's something special to having earned that badge, whether it's something as a sticker on a laptop or a, a hoodie that has something like that. Again, in the military, we had a reward system that was visible, but the unlockable stuff is, well, you don't get to go ahead and just see things. You say, well, hey, I like this medal, this medal. No, you've got to go out and earn it. How about if you had a pizza prize every month? Then people say, like, what do I have to do to get to the pizza party? And the team that goes ahead and does best in terms of their security patching, they gets the highest number of vulnerabilities taken care of, the least number of phishing that gets through or whatever. You get a pizza party. Yes, we're throwing a little bit of money at it, but what we're doing is people unlock some sort of reward and it increases the effectiveness of your program. Then the last one is the concept of a virtual economy. Most games have their own little virtual currency. It could be points, it could be gold coins, time credits, and things like that. It's how you recognize value. Now, is there a way to do things such as that, that you can come up with ways to have people reward them and reward their peers for, for actions taken? Hey, I saw... Johnny patched a server, which really nobody ever wanted to do that. Hey, here's a $5 gift card. Here's something for Starbucks or something at the cafeteria or whatever. Virtual currencies in a game, but we could actually make that tangible a little bit. Doesn't have to be a lot. I remember I'd been with one organization where they had on the phishing, if you clicked on the phishing link, you got a, uh -huh. okay. But if you didn't click on the phishing link, 24 hours later, when they came out and said, okay, fine, here's the recap and this percentage of people clicked on it. But what they did is for everybody who did not click on it, they got entered into a random drawing and somebody got a $25 gift card. And that wasn't a fish either. That was for real. And so from that perspective, there's actually a bit of a motivation there. You get to earn something. You get to win something. And what you want to do is change the perception of just boring mundane practices to something that's going to promote behavior that's positive and working like that. Now, there's a concept used in video games called the magic circle. And it really outlines the fundamental boundaries of your play. Inside there, you've got the rules, the mechanics, the objectives, the roles that players play, whether it's digital or real world and things such as that. But 
What happens though, although it's artificial, you put real world scenarios into that magic circle. And then what happens is people's behaviors can change. And so the game play mechanics, the player objectives, these design, the game aesthetics and things like that, those are sort of the inputs that build that. But if you do it right, you create results and outcomes that are meaningful. You can create influence on people's behavior. You change the culture of your organization. You're able to create learning and knowledge as well as skills, develop skills. Again, these ideas I got from the chaostheorygames.com site. Great place if you want to learn a little bit more. Another thing that I found as I was reading around, Tim Boileau is an Indiana State University professor. And he had talked about applying game concepts to learning. You can find the link in the show notes for, for his presentation. But he had a couple interesting observations. One is this, age is more strongly correlated with gaming than gender. Okay, we always thought that like boys play games and not so many women or girls do, but turns out that 81% of 18 to 29 year olds play games. According to his research, 25% of adults 65 and older play games. This is Pew Foundation research. So it's a younger person's game. And true, and the 12 to 17 year old range, more boys play games on a regular basis than girls do. Boys tend to favor fighting or role playing games and things like that. Girls like casual games. And again, but racing games, rhythm games, simulation games, no discernible gender differences and things like that. And so as a result, most of us are responsible for people as they become adults. But even if we have kids, we can observe behaviors and things such as that and encourage healthy activities for folks. But recognize that for the most part, once you get to the workforce, most people will engage in a game. Now, what goes into a game? There's going to be objectives, which is going to be, what do I have to do? Rules. I have to play within this confine so because I can't just do a cheat code. Well, there used to be good cheat codes. Remember, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, or A, B, or whatever like that. Have some sort of a challenge. There's got to be something worthwhile going after. Another element that goes in a game that works well is randomness or some unpredictability. If it is exactly the same every time, then we repeat the same sequence and all we're doing is we're getting used to saying, okay, now I'm going to go through and like Mario, for example, there wasn't any randomness in it. They, couldn't, they didn't really build that into the old 8-bit games. And so as a result, you became a master when you simply learned a particular sequence. But that sequence doesn't necessarily help you in the real world. When we're talking about changing people's behavior, for example, if I want to change executives' perception of security or I want somebody to understand that, hey, investing in security is going to reduce your risk in certain areas, but not necessarily to zero. So there's a probabilistic thing in there, and that works. And then you want them designed for fun and, and ideally for learning. What makes a game fun? There's a challenge. Requires some reasonable level of difficulty so that you have to work at it. Too difficult, and you walk away from it. Too easy, and it's boring. And most games start out easy and then work their way up fairly quickly so that anybody can get involved and get going. There should be some sort of sense of a fantasy, a compelling setting. Uh, suspend reality for a moment so you're in this fantasy game. Now, when we're talking about cybersecurity and the gamification of what we want, the fantasy may be we're going to place you in charge of this organization. You're the new CISO for a, a company that had just been hacked and the last CISO got uh, well, walked at the door. You got this resource, this, 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 and here you're going to make a series of decisions. Okay, well, after a while, we sort of accept that as our new reality. We suspend our disbelief, and pretty soon, if we're immersed in the game, we're in that fantasy. Curiosity. The random events are great because it makes sure the game is not deterministic. It's not the same rote thing like Mario every time you get to do it over. And then we, you put the person in control. You're confronted with choices, and based upon those choices, things happen. Now, in a learning game, there's active participation because you're actually doing things. You can't just sit back and watch. And ideally, there should be immediate feedback. You don't go ahead and do something and then it says, we'll let you know in 30 days whether your actions were right or not. That immediate feedback helps to shape behavior and it keeps people locked in. A dynamic interaction and ideally a competition. You can either have an individual competing for a high score against somebody else head-to-head -head, or against a posted high score or some level of achievement. There's a lot of ways we can create that. 
a learning game is best if there's some novelty to it, that it's different, it's new, and people go, wow, this is pretty cool. And ultimately, you want to have a goal that you can be directed to. See, learning game research tells us that people in general, particularly learners, have positive attitudes toward game playing if we do it right. And the game appeal works, it increases engagement through the time spent if people find that they're enjoying it. But games for learning ought to be part of your curriculum design and things like that, but they don't replace other forms of instruction. That means to say, don't throw away your security education program and go only to games. Don't go ahead and throw away your whole patching and vulnerability management program and then replace it with a game. This gets added on there. Now, what's so exciting about a learning game? Neuroscience tells us that the research, when we learn something new, our brains were going to release a flood of opioids, you know, pleasure, fulfillment, and things like that. We say, hey, wow, this, these endorphins are pretty cool. And you get a rush when you accomplish something, and it works really well. It's a biological chemical feedback that's positive. Now, if you're going to build a learning game, you want players to engage in some sort of artificial conflict that's defined by the rules and ultimately has some sort of outcome that is quantifiable. You see, a game at its core is a structured learning environment. And in games, we learn a couple of things. New skills. Now, if it's Mario, it might be running and jumping and things like that. Or, or new information, like what's the next level? Or you know, where's the enemy hiding? Or where are the rewards hiding? So in those games, as we think about it, the skills and information that are achieved could either be just for fun, like Mario, or... It could be more related to the work environment where if you get good at it in the artificial game world, you're going to get better at it in the real world. Essentially, games are engagement engines. We make it enjoyable or a satisfying experience, apply rules so that there's some known construct and understanding for it, but then people can enjoy it. And then when we layer on reward systems, doesn't necessarily make us like it any better, but we tolerate it. We, we put up with it because this is pretty cool. We keep hitting that little lever in our brain that says reward, reward, dopamine, dopamine, reward, reward, and it's pretty cool. So in a game, we're going to have a number of different elements. If we have a points system, what does that do? It stimulates a human driver of achieving a reward. Hey, I got 100 points. I got this. If we have levels in our game. It's going to stimulate a human drive for status. All right, I'm at level five, right? A challenge in the game will drive human achievement. If your game includes things like virtual goods and spaces, places that you can have and you can own, that's self-expression. We're starting to see a lot of that as we start to get into kind of the metaverse, which we'll probably cover that in a future episode, but we can see where we're going there. Leaderboards do what? Think about it. We already talked about it. Competition. And in some games, there's ways that you can give gifts or do some charitable things because some humans have a drive for altruism. Not everybody, but some of us like to do good things for other people. And if you build that into the game, it's going to hit that natural resonance with human behavior. Now, while most games unfold in this sort of magic circle we'd be talking about earlier, remember when I had mentioned that when we're looking at a magic circle, then we've got the gameplay mechanics, the objectives, the design and content, and the game aesthetics. Behavioral games, we want to unfold in our offices, in our work environment. That is to say, the scenario should be close enough to the real world that people can relate to it. Now, most behavioral games only have an audience of one, which means you can tailor it for learning. If you have everybody in there playing a game at once, trying to beat each other, it's a little bit different. Now, there are ways that it works. I know Capture the Flags are definitely not audience of one. But, for example, if you remember at the Capture the Flag challenges they have, you know, SANS has a great one, and they do that pretty much at every major conference. Well, you can get the, the SANS stuff to take at home. You can basically get a 90-day license uh, to practice your skills alone. But it's more fun when you go there. You can see the leaderboard. They've got a lot of people just banging away, hacking away, and you're trying to go ahead and individuals and teams. And, and they've got that part nailed. And the whole advantage of that is, is more that you play these capture the flag games, the better you go ahead and get better at the skills that you're trying to include into your people's repertoire. 
So what can we do? Any activity can turn into a game if you do this. If the player can be measured and the activity can be learned. It's got to be measurable and it's something that people can learn. Now the play can be rewarded or punished in a timely fashion because again, as we said before, if you just say, hey, we're going to tell you how you did in 30 days, it's not going to change people's behavior. So finally, as we design a game framework, I'm going to turn to a book that I got from Aaron Dignan. It's called Game Frame, Using Games as Strategies for Success, published in 2011. And like a lot of my books I go through there, I didn't realize I got first printing, first edition. So I don't, I'm hopefully they printed more of them. It was a pretty good book. But in any case, here's what I learned by going through that reference. He says that there's 10 different building blocks that are linked to a design framework. Number one, activity, something we want players to do more of or do it better or do it differently. Activities are verbs. There are things that you do. Number two is understanding the player profile. It's the game in terms of the drivers that motivate players. Do our players want to achieve goals or just enjoy the experience? Do they want structure and guidance or the freedom to explore? Do we want to control others or accept other players as they are? And lastly, do they exhibit self-interest or social interest in their actions? See, every player has preferences in each of these pairs, these dyads. And if your target audience shares certain preferences, and you design the game that way, you're much more likely to hold their interest. Number three would be objectives. Objectives are goals toward which the effort's directed. There's a long-term objective, which is the ultimate objective when the game's been won. Okay, you beat Bowser. And then the short-term, the things you accomplish along the way. You stomp on the Goomba. All right. Number four, your skills. Your skills are specialized abilities that you put into the behavioral games. What is it that we want our people to learn how to do? In something like a Mario, you learn how to do running and jumping. That's a physical skill. Other games may have mental skills like memory or pattern recognition. And then still others could have social skills like presentation or conversation or ways to elicit response from other players. So one activity two, player profile, three, objectives, four, skills, and five is resistance. Resistance is a force of opposition that creates some sort of a tension in your behavioral game. The competition pits players against one another. By putting elements of chance in your game, it subjects the players to unpredictable circumstances, which creates some sort of an interest. Wow, I got, I got to try this thing again. Maybe I'll get lucky the next time. It works for casinos. Number six, resources. This is the supplies, the spaces that players are used or have the potential to acquire in behavioral games. Now, resources will have attributes. What can they do? Okay, this is a vorpal blade and it cuts off people's heads. Or they have states. They're active or inactive. And so what we want to do is have resources available to our players. Number seven, actions. These are the moves that players get in the behavioral game. They've got decisions and choices. It influences the tone and the style of the game. And as a result, it's the player's actions that cause that input that creates the next item, number eight, the feedback. Feedback is a system's response to the player's actions. It could be data. It could be information. It could be auditory stimulation. It could be something stars and bells and whistles going off, but if you didn't have any feedback, it'd be really unclear what the actions have in your behavioral game. Another quick sea story. So when I was a midshipman in the Navy, one of the things we did is a program they called Cortremid. You would spend a week with the surface Navy, a week with the submarine force, a week with the Marines, a week with the aviators. So try to figure out what is you want to do when you got your career. And I remember during aviation, we were down in Kingsville, Texas, and we got a chance to fly the, I think it was the A4 simulators. And it was a full motion simulator. It's a big deal. These are the real things. We get in there and you get to fly the plane. Well, I had no flight lessons at that time. I got my pilot's license now, but I certainly didn't back then. But they got you up there and they said, okay, fine, you're 25,000 feet and you're flying north. And you could go around, you move the stick left, you could mm, you'd feel the thing move and you dive and pull up. Well, after a while, things, the guys uh, that were other midshipmen that were playing around the console started doing stuff. So what they did is one of the guys just said, hey, can we do a full panel outage? So I'm there flying my simulator along with three other midshipmen. I guess I had four of them in the room as I can recall. And then all of a sudden, full panel failure. Everything goes dark. 
You can't see your altitude. You can't see your airspeed. You can't see your heading direction. Nothing. So what do you do? I just took the stick and centered it and pulled it back ever so slightly and just sat there. And what seemed like five minutes, but was probably 30 seconds, then all the panel comes back on and the altimeter unwinds a little bit, but I was okay. I was straight and level and I was just kind of in a, in a, a cruise. Everybody else crashed their plane because without that feedback, they're pushing left, pushing back, pushing forward, pushing right. They put the aircraft into some unsustainable state and they lost it. So if you don't have any feedback, you don't know what to do. And sometimes in life, when you don't have any feedback, just centering the stick and just waiting until something happens might be your best choice. All right, just a little bit of life lessons. Number nine, the black box. The black box is a rules engine within your behavioral game, and it contains all the information about the interplay between the actions and the feedback and things such as that. And then lastly, the outcomes. The outcomes of your positive results or your negative results that could occur while pursuing these objectives in this game. It could have tangible outcomes, something like resources, intangible, like moving up a level of reward and things such as that. And so what we find then is that there's a lot of concepts that we can use in gamification. You'll find that players tend to stratify into different levels. You have the killers, the ones who want to go ahead and win at all costs. They want to win on the leaderboard. You have achievers who want to unlock achievements and points and focus on moving up. There are socializers who want to go ahead and make friends or chat or go ahead and interact with the other players. And there's even explorers who want to say, let me find the hidden content. Let me find the, the, the stuff that nobody else has found and explore. If you better understand who your target audience is, you can better design your game. I mean, at the end of the day, gamification works. It takes measurement, motivational psychology, and well, basic fun into an existing or an improved work process and activities. And now we can foster desired behaviors and results. We're going to change an organization that's reactive and make it proactive. We can take programs that require heroic efforts and programs that can produce legendary results because people are going to say, I can be that hero. I want to do it. We've changed their behavior in a fun way where the actions, the skills that they've learned represent real world helpful attributes that can put you in a better shape. Try it out. Let us know if it works out. I think it's an important piece of your CISO tradecraft. It's going to help out your organization, and it's going to help out your career. So take a look at the show notes if you'd like to learn a little bit more, because there's some outstanding references out there. But this is about everything I can sque squeeze in to our 45-minute window. So that wraps it up for another episode of CISO Tradecraft. And thank you again for sticking with us together on this, this show, and hopefully you enjoyed it. If you had, send it to someone at work or subscribe. Ask them to subscribe. Hear more great content. Love to tell you more success stories from our listeners. So if you found CISO Tradecraft to help your career, send us a comment at CISOTradecraft.com or reach out to us on LinkedIn. By the way, we just crossed 3,000 followers on LinkedIn. So help us up that number. If everybody following us brought one friend, we'd be up to 6,000 and we'd be able to make a huge difference out there. We'd love to share the impact our show is making with others and help others. Again, this is your host, G. Mark Hardy, and thanks again for listening. And until next time, stay safe.